Uh, good afternoon. Um, let's uh, begin at 6.30. I know that when it rains in Houston, a lot of people don't really come out. Um, and I know why. There's a lot of flooding going around. But thank you for coming and taking the time to join us in this discussion. Uh, my name is Tony Payan. I'm the director of the Mexico Center here at Rice University's uh, Baker Institute. Uh, on behalf of the Mexico Center at Rice University's Baker Institute, I want to welcome you uh, to um, I welcome you all um, to what I hope is the beginning of a new conversation on brains, talent, and skills. This issue is of particular interest to me because I first came to the Baker Institute three years ago next month to work on a project on immigration. And even though immigration is often a contentious issue, and not one often associated with brains, talent, and skills, uh, we now know that migrants, even those with little schooling, are talented and skillful and carry enormous intellectual potential in their brains. And they are quite capable of contributing to the betterment of society anywhere they are. This panel was called for the purpose of linking these two, brains, talent, and skills on the one hand, and on the other hand, the people who move across borders in order to both seek a better life, but also to actualize their full intellectual potential. We do this in the hope of contributing to changing the debate on immigration and revaluing both the movement of people and presence of migrants in our midst, both legal and illegal. And by the way, this morning as I was listening to NPR, I heard a very interesting piece um, and it was an economist who was trying to examine what exactly happened in New York City, reminiscing some of the uh, films in the 1980s that came out about New York City and how New York City was essentially a city that people wanted to get out of, uh, a city in decay. Uh, and um, the uh, uh, speaker uh, said that uh, New York City uh, had recovered essentially thanks to migrants. It went from a 16% foreign-born population to a third, 33, 34% born population, and that when these migrants came into the city, the city essentially entered a revival. And uh, these migrants moved into neighborhoods um, that had been abandoned, repaired homes, opened businesses, uh, reactivated the economy, and today the city is a vibrant city in large uh, part thanks to this one full third of foreign-born New York City uh, people. So this is another example to me of how uh, immigrants bring their talents, their skills, and their brains, and they can revive communities. So by linking these two topics, the issue of immigration, legal or illegal, and the fact that these people are actually very talented and they carry skills and they carry intellectual potential is important to associate to see if we can once more push uh, for immigration reform. And uh, to do this, we have a wonderful panel tonight, uh, one that has everything it takes to begin to reappraise the value of immigration and migrants and push the horizons of this uh, debate. Let me present our panel tonight, and I'm very happy to uh, to tell you that I met with him uh, uh, for about an hour right before, and we had a really interesting conversation. I hope we can bring it to bear uh, before you. Uh, first, uh, we have a well-known name on immigration uh, issues, uh, Nestor Rodriguez, and I told him that I had uh, heard about him quite a bit, and I'm very happy to meet him. Uh, Nestor is a professor of sociology and an associate of the Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, the Population Research Center, and the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latina Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. His research concerns the topics of international migration, race, and ethnic relations, urban development, and U.S. migration policies. He has participated in research activities in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. His recent publications include the co-authored book, Guatemala, U.S. Migration, Transforming Regions. And he was very kind to give me a copy of that. Um, uh, published by the University of Texas Press in 2014. 
two forthcoming co-edited volumes, Migration in an Era of Restriction and the International Handbook of the Demography of Race and Ethnicity and the co-authored articles Deporting Social Capital, the Removal of Salvadoran Migrants from the United States in the Journal of Migration Studies and Deporting Fathers, Intent to Remigrate Among Salvadoran Deportees in International Migration Review. Rodriguez received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, I want to introduce you to Gabriela Sanchez Soto, um, uh, whom I just also met uh, uh, myself. And it was a wonderful conversation. And thanks for, for coming, Gabriela. She's an assistant uh, professor of demography at the University of Texas in San Antonio. Her research interests include migration and immigration, family demography, and the transition to adulthood. Her ongoing research focuses on the family formation, educational attainment, and labor market outcomes of immigrant youth in the United States. Her most recent work explores the occupational status and occupational mo mobility among Latin American migrants to the United States, as well as the returns on education for US-born and foreign-born Hispanics. In previous research, she focused on the effects of migration on the socioeconomic status of families and migrants, the role of international migration in the schooling of youth, and the effects of migration on family formation and family stability. For her PhD dissertation, she studied the relationship between US migration and the educational attainment and educational mobility of youth in Mexico. As a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University's Office of Population Research, she collaborated with the New Immigrant Society, uh, Survey, the Mexican Migration Project, and the Latin American Migration Project. She holds a PhD in sociology from Brown University. And I'm pleased to introduce to you, finally, uh, my colleague and also a non-resident scholar of the Mexico Center here at the Baker Institute, Jesus Velasco. Jesus is a non-resident scholar here at the Baker Institute, Mexico Center, and the Joe and Teresa Long Endowed Chair in Social Sciences at Tarleton State University, somewhere around Dallas. Um, he's a former visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson um, uh, Center, the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University and Harvard's Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. For many years, Velasco worked at the Center for Teaching and Research <coughs> Economics, CIDE, in Mexico City. He's the author of Neoconservatives in U.S. Foreign Policy under Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, Voices Behind the Throne, and co-editor of Bridging the Border, Transforming U.S.-Mexico Relations. He has published several articles on American politics and U.S.-Mexico relations. Currently, he's preparing an opinion poll to survey high-skilled Mexicans uh, in the United States. He's also writing a book on the relationship between the Mexican government and the American transnational intellectuals from 1920 to 2006. Velasco earned a PhD in political science at the University of Texas at Austin and a BA in history at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Welcome. And I suggest that uh, Jesus uh, will kind of frame the issue for us. And then uh, I will ask. Uh, uh, Let's see, uh, Gabriela to go next, and then Nestor uh, to close it in for us, and then we'll have a uh, conversation which I hope will be of great use to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, either way, you can come up here or you can do it from there. And can I use this clicker? Uh, you can, you can use the clicker from there. Oh, it's a laser, okay. Who is gonna change the uh, uh, presentation? Kevin, I'm sure Kevin is watching us. And oh, you, thank you. There you go. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, let me apologize for my tropical accent, but I hope that you will understand me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's uh, the second time that I'm in Rice, and this is a fantastic university. So I just want to thank the organizer, Tony, Dylan, uh, Lisa, and Erica, all of them that were so nice to convey to this panel. Um, what I would like to do today is just to present a general overview. When we think about U.S.-Mexican relations, uh, we, uh, sorry, immigration, can we move to the next one? This is the image that we have. Most of the time when we talk about immigration, we have this, but very rarely we have the following. Uh, this is Mario Molina, Nobel Prize winner of chemistry. Uh, this is Jorge Castañeda, that is professor at NYU and former uh, 
former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. This is Mauricio Tenorio, perhaps the most distinguished historian of his generation. He's professor at University of, of Chicago, and his last book on Mexico City won the Best Book Award in Latin American Studies just recently, about two months ago. And so what I would like to do today is to offer an explanation of why the Mexicans are leaving Mexico and coming to the United States and assess what are the implications for this movement of people that come to the United States and what are the implications for Mexico and the United States. Uh, and my hypothesis or my thesis that I would like to present to you is that there are structural reasons that are behind this movement that are not gonna change. So the Mexicans, the high-skilled workers, and by high-skilled workers, I mean people with BA or higher, uh, MAs or PhD, will continue to come and will continue to come in greater numbers. So let me start with, with just these are the topics that I'm gonna, gonna address. First, some numbers about this. Second, why are they coming? What is the explanation? Third, what are the implications for Mexico and the United States? And finally, some concluding remarks. So let me start because I only have 15 minutes. I got to go fast and uh, with, with some numbers, please. Uh, you know, if we go and see, see the numbers, what we have is that we have around 30,000 people coming to the United States in the year 2000. By 2010, we have 530,000 people. So many of, the, this, is, this is very important if you consider that Mexico, we have 7.2 of education, grades of education. So the people that are high skilled worker are not the elite, are the elite of the elite of the elite. So, and this is even more rebuilding if you consider that in Mexico we are about 30,000 PhDs, 11 of them live and work in the United States just in the United States, besides other countries, there are people in all over the world. The, the next one, please. Uh, we, can, we can see that in, in 2012, there were 4,500, um, 4, uh, but in 20, 2014, there were more than 5,000. This is not only in the United States, but what you can see is that many of them uh, are coming to the United States to study PhDs, MAs, or, or technical abilities. I don't know, to manage some equipment in medicine that they do not exactly how to do it in Mexico, and, uh, and they learn here in the United States. The next one, please. Who are these guys? Many of them are the best the best that Mexico can produce. Not all of them, of course, but many of them. Let me just give you a couple of them. R Rodolfo Dirso, if you go ahead with the next one, please. Rodolfo Dirso, it's uh, the next one, is this guy. He's, uh, he's an, a person working in environmentalist uh, issues. He was at the National University for about 25 years. He went to give it three times lectures in, in, in Stanford, and the third one, they got together with the dean, and the dean said, uh, we would like you to come to work for us. And, and, and Dirzo said, but I've been working in my life for 25 years, and what does you life have? And he said, uh, well, this, this, and that. Well, what about if we build you a lab? That, that's pretty cool. Well, what, what about uh, I have to work with my butterflies in Veracruz, Mexico? Well, what about if we give you three months to go um, to Veracruz and do your stuff over there? But I have like 10 st uh, PhD students that work with me. Oh, don't worry, we will give you that. In other words, they gave him everything, even a building. So th this is dear. So, and of course, he's one of the eight members of the American National Academy of Science that are from Mexico. The next one, please. Um, he got all of this that you, can, that you can see. He's a very distinguished scholar. The next one, maybe you already know. Um, if you go to the next one, please. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Q. Dr. Q, it's very famous in the United States. If you go to the next one, he was, he was a guy that crossed the border from Mexicali, Mexico, when he was 17 years old. And after that, oh, that's a clicker, great. Uh, and after that, um, he didn't learn, he didn't speak a single word in English. He works in the fields of California. Then he managed to go to a community college. 
Then he went to Berkeley, transferred for the community college to Berkeley. He ended up in Harvard Medical School. And right now, he is one of the main neurosurgeons in the country, this guy. And, uh, and he directs the lab of Johns Hopkins University, University Hospital. How he did it, I don't even have a clue, but he did it. Uh, why they, they are coming? First, because the United States pulled them, because the United States wants to have them. First, the, if you finish an MA or a PhD in engineering of math, you get automatically your green card. Second, because the private sector wants you. So you can read what Bill Gates said. He wants the best and the price in the United States. And if you see what Yale University says right there, it's exactly the same idea. They hire the best around the world. And some of the Mexicans are very good. The second reason is that uh, uh, GDP. If you see how much GDP people invest in research and development, you go, for instance, Mexico for a long, long time was 0 0.39, 0 0.40 when we were very lucky. Right now, the president promised that before he finished his term, he will be 1%. Right now, we are 0 0.51. Other countries are in these numbers. But of course, you might say, wow, they are very developed countries. Well, go with Argentina. They only have football, meets, and tango. And they have 0 0.61, <laughs> right? And then you go to Brazil, that they are highly depressed because they lost in the World Cup. So <laughs> 1.25. You see, so th this, is, this is unbelievable. Instability of the Mexican academic research is horrible. I can spend hours and hours telling you about this. If you want me, we can talk about this in the discussion. But the bureaucracy is horrible. Then we go to the, to the salaries. And the salaries is very important, the, the, the difference in salary between Mexico and the United States. So in Mexico, for instance, if you hire a just guy that finished a PhD in the United States or in Mexico in an important uh, academic institution, he's going to be earning around 30000 per year. If you hire in UT Austin, it's 85000 right? So it's, it's horrible. But if you go to the top Mexicans, many of them earn better than the Americans. And if you go to the business people, that many of them are highly, highly uh, trained, you know, that the, all the people that live in Woodlands right here, you know, that is like a Mexican Polanco. Uh, and uh, if you go there, these people are where many of them train in the United States. And for business people, the Mexicans pay better than the Americans in general terms. So why do they come? That's and there are the problems of living in Mexico. Well, security reasons is one of them. Just look at this, these figures. Kidnapping, for instance, in 2013, uh, more than 1,500 people just kidnapping. Extortion, 8,000 people. If you go, th this, is, this is an organization, a civil organization, Mexico Against Delinquency, or Mexico Unido Contra la Delincuencia, Mexican victims. Uh, just look the numbers, 22%, 2015, 30%. Just the years, the first, uh, from 2014 to 2015. So criminality is, a, is an important factor. Uh, what, I, what I see that is one of the most important figures is this one, 60% of the Mexicans are afraid that they will be kidnapped or robbery. 60% are afraid. So when you go out, you. <laughs> you are afraid. I don't know how to put it in the other terms. There is one survey, not very important because the numbers are very small, that were 148 people, 76% of those Mexicans that live around the world, not only in the United States, said that they leave the country because of security reasons. Okay. What, what are um, implications, the benefits for the United States? Well, the United States is a free rider. You know, most of the people that study in, in the in Mex uh, that come to the United States study in Mexico primary, middle school, uh, high school, university. 
Then they come with money with the Mexican government, most of them, not all of them, finish a PhD, and then you hire them. Great, not investment, good job. Second, there's the possibility that they come with a binational scholarship like the Fulbright. So uh, part of this is paid by the American government, paid by the Mexican government, and there is a minority that come, and I think, Gabby, you are one of those, I, I'm not remember exactly, yeah. that are financed by the university. But these are the elite's universities, like Brown, and, uh, or, or Harvard, or Princeton. Or, or, uh, so um, so this, is, this is one. The other is that the U.S. receive a high qualified Mexicans because the process to come to the United States, it's a very complicated one. You only, not only have to apply and be accepted, but the Mexican government has to, uh, to recognize you as a possible good student. So you pass kind of tests in Mexico. For instance, I couldn't come to the United States with, with a scholarship of the Mexican government because a bureaucrat said that I do not speak English. So I couldn't come. But I came with a scholarship from the Ford Foundation, which are Americans. That's a different uh, uh, ball game. Um, the Mexicans affect, shape, and many others, not only the Mexicans, the science that we do here. For instance, Rodolfo D uh, Dirso start talking about how losing the big animals, the megafauna, affects uh, 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 or uh, increments the diseases that the human beings uh, face, especially in small towns. He started doing this in Chiapas, Mexico. Right now he's doing this in Kenya with the money of, the, of, the, um, of Stanford University. Uh, implications for Mexico, Mexico is losing some of the best uh, professionals. These people do not pay taxes, these people do not send money at least it's very difficult to trace. I conduct about 30 interviews to do this paper, and just one said that he sent sometimes money to bring his mother to visit twice a, twice a year him in the United States. The other don't say anything. And if they send it, they send it through wires, like bank, uh, not, not the regular, not the undocumented migrants sent. They are not mentoring anybody. They are not paying taxes in Mexico. There are some policy of retention. There is a need that is a, 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 a organization that give you some money if you are a scholar and publish. The, the government in Conacyt runs a reputation program, which is important because they give you some money and, uh, to the person and also to the institution, but that's not enough. And so what are the possibilities? Well, people believe that it's brain circulation. Because many of these people recognize that it's impossible to stop this. There's no way that's going to stop, right? And f I just went to Mexico two weeks ago. I have a conversation with two leaders, one in UNAM and one in CIDE. And they said, all the internationalists that we tried to hire, that were like 10 people, ended up in the United States. They do not want to come. We couldn't hire a single Mexican one. <laughs> That's, of course, an anecdote. And so uh, this is, this is what, what um, th the Mexican government has also promoted what they call Mexican Talent Network, which is promoted by the Mexican government, not finance, and they organize every council, organize the people that they know that are high-skilled workers, and trying to promote connections between Mexico and the United States, but that's not enough, and the Mexican government don't put too much effort in that. So um, what can Mexico do? Well, first, to identify the scholars, we do not know. And we are trying, and a colleague of mine and the National University, to launch a survey in a couple months to really try to detect who are these Mexicans living in the United States. Second, support uh, Conacyt. Conacyt should, should support people abroad. For instance, it's a very horrible situation in Mexico because I, I ha I'm legal here, I have a green card, but I cannot apply to Fulbright because Fulbright is only for Americans. If I go to Mexico and I say I want to apply to the Mexican Fulbright, I can't because you have to be working in a Mexican institution. So it's very complicated for us to get financial aid or assistance. We should have joint programs between Mexico and the United States, which 
is already going. I mean, for instance, there's one program between Mexico and California that is running very well, but, but th there's need more. The other possibility is also to have transnational classes. I promote this, and it has been very successful between CIDE, my former institution, and Johns Hopkins. So there are parts that the program is taught by a Mexican um, professor, and the other part is by the American, and they get together in sessions. Um, and then there's, there's very common in the United States when you are a senior professor to have a dual appointment. And I propose that we might have a dual appointment, but between Mexico and the United States. That's, that's a way that we, people can circulate. So um, just, just to finalize this, the Americans have a policy to retain these people. Mexico don't. Uh, given the disparity, this will continue for the years to come. This is not way that we're going to stop. And uh, there is, in, in many ways, already an integrated part of research and development between Mexico and the United States. In a little part, not in the, the amount that we would like, but there is already something there. So just to finish, I think that we will continue with this because the structural reasons that I mentioned before like security, like uh, research and development, the money research and development, all of those are not going to change. Quite probably will worst. So many Mexicans will come to the United States and other parts of the world to develop their own careers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. Thanks. I'm actually going to stand up because um, I would like to be seeing my slides. Um, do you need a pointer? Yeah. There's your little clicker over there. Yeah. My neck's a bit strained by now. Um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit because I'm going to tell you some just some highlights from a couple of projects I've been working on that have to do with m immigrants in general. But a lot of what I'm actually estimating is, is, a, is applicable to some of these highly educated um, groups. Um, today I'm just going to present something about the Mexican results just to kind of keep it balanced with the stuff Jesus was talking about. But if you would like to hear a little bit more about some of the other things I've done with Latin American migration project data, I can tell you, you know, how it contrasts with the Mexican data. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this idea that um, really, you know, a very important thing that we should understand, and I think Jesus highlighted a little bit with the highly skilled, but I would like to say that this is something that applies to most of the migrants, which is that um, most of you, you know, will get your job given your qualifications or given your skills or given your experiences. That will count in the labor market and you will get a job. Immigrants, when they come to a new place, they really depend a lot on other things besides their own experiences. You know, sometimes they might have the human capital, but they don't have the credentials. They don't have the right documents. Maybe they went to college in Latin America, but they don't have um, language skills that will allow them to, you know, speak off their, um, particular technical skills in the US. And this is for the ones who studied in Mexico or Latin America and are coming to the US. Um, and at the same time, they might not have local social capital. Like, they don't have the kind of networks that can get them jobs. They might not have access to the kind of information that will get them a, a job in the US as college degree or high school degree holders. They might have more access to the undocumented work networks that most Mexicans have access to. At the same time, the labor market is highly segmented, meaning we all know this anecdotally, but the way we demographers call about and sociologists talk about it is the segmentation of the labor market, right? You have jobs that are stereotypically associated to immigrants. Um, so, you know, Mexicans concentrate in the services industry, Mexicans concentrate in construction and agriculture. And that, believe it or not, does have a bearing on the access to jobs for Mexicans. Um, at the same time, the more time Mexicans or Latin Americans spend in the U.S., we expect them to maybe gain the skills and the uh, knowledge and the cultural capital that would allow them to improve their, um, their jobs, or so we think. Now, the first uh, set of results I'm, I'm going to talk about is this paper we've been writing with some of my colleagues at UTSA, where we've been, we've been using data on Mexican migrants to measure whether migrants um, 
are getting jobs comparable to the jobs they left in Mexico when they come to the US. And we're using a sample of Mexicans, uh, Mexican migrants generally, um, you know, some of them documented, undocumented, educated, not educated. Um, and we also want to know if over time, as they spend more time in the US, do they get better jobs? Do they you know, go back to the, where they were? So to do this study, we've been using data from the Mexican Migration Project. And this is a fantastic source of data because it contains both labor and migration histories of migrants. So we know for everybody who was interviewed where they worked be, during their, through, through their whole, traject, whole trajectory before and after coming to the US. So it's fantastic. And even if they went back to Mexico, because most of them are interviewed in Mexico, then you get information of what they did after. Um, so we use this data to select migrants who came here for work purposes. And then we measure, well, um, creating a classification of occupations, we measure what kind of job did they have before they left, and then what kind of job did they get when they got to the US. And using this, we compare both the last, the, this occupation uh, for men and women. Uh, at the same time, then we measured it again, like maybe five years after. And then we used 10 years after, and then the last year of migration. So to see if the trajectory continues the same or changes. Um, some of the things we found, and I'm just going to give you very, very brief highlights. One of them is that uh, some men and men and women have very different trajectories of occupation. Firstly, men are actually somewhat upwardly mobile, meaning they got jobs that were slightly better. Granted, a lot of this is driven by Mexican agricultural workers who came to the US to work in the urban economy. So let's say instead of being a peasant, you became a McDonald's worker. So this is not so much of a jump in status, but it is a slight jump in status. So this high degree of upward mobility whoop, that you see here, that you see in the last bar of the men's graph is slightly artificially inflated by this agricultural workers moving to urban jobs. Uh, however, we don't seem to see any degree of upward mobility for females. Females tend to stay in very similar jobs to the one they had in Mexico, but they also tend to end up in worse jobs than the ones they had in Mexico. Now, I know this is very broad, but just to give you an illustration, I have this graph here, which is basically a matrix of where they were, where they were in Mexico on the um, left side. And then at the top is the same categories, but for the job they obtain in the US. And those numbers represent percentages. So what we have here, and this is for men. So the men have somewhat, some, a somewhat correspondence. You know, If anything that is in the diagonal will be that you got a job that is comparable to the job you had in Mexico. We see that at the lower levels of skill, there's more of that but not at the high level. So I want to point out that 11% at the top. So only 11% of the professional degree holders or technical degree holders coming from Mexico to the US actually ended up in an occupation of similar status, which is terrible. Most of them ended up in jobs in management, services. And this has to do a lot with this as I was mentioning, the structure of the labor market economy for immigrants. This might have to do a lot with the fact that many Mexicans, even if they're more educated than the average Mexican, might be here without documents. So bear that in mind. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that a lot of them, regardless of their ability, so you have some professional, some skill, some administrative, ended up in the column for agricultural employment. So this concentration of migrants in a migrant job is quite evident. This varies a lot over time, I have to say, but you know, generally the trend seems to happen. Now, um, then we did the same thing, but for the last job that they held in the US, we actually found out that there was so little mobility throughout the migration history of these migrants that if I focus on five years or 10 years or 15 years, it didn't really matter so much. It wasn't too different. So what we did here is that we took all the migrants who had spent at least five years in the US, and then we saw where they went uh, occupationally uh, in their, um, while they were still in the US. Unfortunately, most of them stayed in the same type of job. So those, of, those people who actually went down in the occupational structure did not seem to recover. 
And this is really the takeaway. Um, the other takeaway is that in our estimations, which I'm not going to show you now for you know, time's sake, we saw that the people who had college degrees were actually slightly better at recovering from these um, downturn. So if you came to the US, but you have a college degree, maybe even if you started off down below where you expected, you were likely to recover. Um, documented migrants also were more likely to recover. And uh, men were very likely to recover from these downturns. Females, unfortunately, have the worst of it. Even if they were college educated, many of these females either left the labor force or they ended up in employment um, that was non-commensurate to their um, skills or their degrees. Now, some of, um, some of the things I have here, is already, there are already things that I've already told you. And the, the, the thing that is kind of worrisome from my point of view is that the occupational structure for these immigrants is actually very rigid. And um, the problem is, is that you know, most of it is driven by documentation. But for some immigrants, even documentation even with documentation, they might not be able to get the credentials they had in Mexico. Think about medical professionals, for instance, who will probably need to get retrained in the US and recertified in the US if they wanted to translate their occupation. The other thing is also, obviously, that we don't know that much about other aspects of the labor market. And some of, this, some of these things have to do with learning about, well, maybe you have a worse job in the US, but you make a lot more money than you would make in Mexico for the same job that you had before. So perhaps even though you're not gaining in social status, you're gaining economically. So this is something that we are going to explore in the future. And actually, right now, I have some very preliminary results on something that we did as well, where we're comparing um, salaries. So in this case, we're looking at Hispanics in general. But the thing we did is that we break them down between foreign born and US born, and between Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, other Hispanics. The, the, groups are, the data groups are actually quite small, so we cannot really break them down too much. But today, I'm going to show you a little bit about what we know for Mexicans. One of the things that happens is that we know that the labor market is not very fair, right? There's, the, there's a significant cost of being a minority, and specifically in occupational achievement and in salaries. So a lot of research that has been done way before I came around um, has actually documented wage differentials for Hispanics compared to Anglos or non-Hispanic whites. Right? So even if Mexicans had the same occupation or Hispanics had the same occupation, they would be making less money. Um, so one of the things we wanted to see was, well, would this be holding also for foreign-born immigrants? And would this be also holding for different groups of Hispanics? Um, so in this particular case, we took census data from the American Community Survey, where they, they don't have the most detailed information about migration, which is a caveat, but they have a large sample of people all over the, from all over the country. And we have information on their wages, and we have information on the, um, their, their immigrant status and their Hispanic um, ethnicity status. And we use also statist different statistical techniques that I can get in, into if you want me to in the Q&A, but I'm not going to dwell too much into, to see whether immigrants are making more or less money if we compare them fairly to non-Hispanic whites and obviously compare them to other Hispanics. Some of the things that we see in this project is that, um, I'm going to skip to this, is that they don't. And this apparently is worse for college-educated migrants. So what we did here is that we created estimations um, accounting for many different characteristics. And then we predicted an average salary. This average salary is relatively low, because as you might expect, income distributions are actually quite wide. So if you know anything about statistics, you would know that giving a mean will actually push it down a little bit if the distribution is a bit too wide. However, what I want you to see here is the gaps, not the monetary amounts. So an average person, all things being equal. So this is a same person, non-Hispanic white origin, same person, Mexican origin. The only thing we're changing is that they ha whether they have a college degree or a high school degree, whether they're foreign-born Mexican or whether they're native-born Mexican, and whether they're non-Hispanic whites. And what we see here is that actually, if you have a high school degree, which is a red bar, <laughs> your salary is relatively comparable. Basically, if you have the same skills or the same education or the same background, mm -hmm. you're kind of the same. And these this, this bars are actually not significantly different from one another. But if you have a college degree and you're a foreign-born Mexican, for instance, you probably would make slightly less 
than your white peers. Which is, and this is all, everything constant. You are the same otherwise, you know, education level wise and such. Now, this is probably driven by people who don't have a PhD or master's degrees. So most of these people are actually people who have just college degrees, so bear that in mind, because the numbers of people with PhDs are so small that the estimations would not be very um, accurate. Now, we also did the same for, for females, and for females, actually, the effect is, um, well, females in general make less money than males, uh, no matter how you see it, and some of it has to do with, you know, uh, the, the integration of females in the labor market in many other ways, and, you know, I can talk more about it if you want me to, but most of you probably have already heard about in income disparities for females and males. Um, but again, the same trend remains. Uh, Mexican, foreign-born Mexicans are not as able to um, reap the benefits of their professional or college degrees as much as whites do. So, and this is, by the way, uh, accounting for composition, accounting for the fact that the distribution of education is different among the two groups. So it's quite interesting. Now, the interesting here to consider is precisely that these gaps remain even after we cons consider the fact that these groups are different demographically. You know, you would tell me, well, but you know, Mexicans have fewer people with college degrees. Well, even if you account for that, they are not making as much. And I actually am really curious, now that I heard Jesus, I'm actually really curious to rerun re some of this data to try to see if this would hold for people with PhDs. <laughs> so I would have to go to my data and check it out just exclusively for people with PhDs, because you were talking a little bit about that they were making slightly more money. I want to see if that holds for the entire population. Remember, all of this is nat nat nationally representative, so I'm not making specific estimations for a particular place. Um, now. There are definitely benefits to being a U.S. citizen, so some of these disparities are much smaller for U.S. citizens. Um, and I think Cubans and Puerto Ricans do very well in this. So just to give you a hint of some of the other, the other Hispanic groups that we were studying. The other thing is also that um, females, again, don't do very well. They seem to have the highest penalty. They seem to have the lowest return to their schooling. These might have to do with things like interruption and incorporation, uh, interruption in, in their labor market careers. This might have to be with maybe more barriers to their um, professional development, maybe they spend more time interrupting their career versus men would do. There's a lot of possible explanations, but we've been working on some of these, and um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions on this if you, uh, oh, you have a question already? Uh, let's, let's keep them for a second and, and go through the last one, and so don't forget your question. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, we'll go through uh, next Stuart's presentation, and then we'll open it to we'll have 30 minutes for a conversation, so it'll sh it should be very good. Um, Thank you so much, Gabriela, and you're really on time. <laughs> oh, I was, I was trying so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll give you a race for that. Um, yes, that's it. Uh, okay, uh, so we'll listen to that for about 15 minutes and we'll open it. Thanks. Okay. okay well Thank you for inviting me. And so I want to present some perspectives on the Mexican brain drain. And but before that, I wanted to start with just talking about. Let's see here. Right, where do I? Okay, here we go. Um, the search for brain power for STEM: science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And. I, in 1958, Congress passed this law, the National Defense Education Act, to, to help more young people go to college. And I know after the GI Bill in that time, this was like, a, like the second major effort that provided resources for, for all kinds of young people, and especially racial minorities that could to go into college. But the basis for the National Defense Education Act was fear that the U.S. had fallen behind the Russians because the year before, October the 4th, 1957, the Russians had launched Sputnik into space and the U.S. felt like, we're behind, we need more engineers, we need more scientists, right? And that fear led to the passage of the National Defense Education Act. I think my own brother got money out of this to go to a community college in, in Corpus Christi. So my own family benefited from the Cold War. Uh, but the government's concern for s the search for talent 
endured into the 80s and into the 90s, and it's still there. Uh, I remember when I was here in Houston for, for about 20 years at the University of Houston, and I was invited to NASA to join a group of researchers to do consultant work for the Pentagon. And the Pentagon was concerned was, how do we get more women and racial minorities to go into science and mathematics? And they say, you know, we can get a lot of scientists from other countries, but it's gonna be really hard to get uh, security clearances for foreign-born scientists. And it's easier to get clearances for, to work in uh, defense industries for US-born people. And so their concern was that for non-Hispanic whites, there's you know, proportional representation in science and technology, uh, mathematics, uh, occupations, and even for Asians, uh, Asian Americans, but blacks and Hispanics lag behind. The blue is a percent that are involved in science and technology occupations. See? So it's this, this gap right here that's, that's driving the surge for talent and it attracts people from other countries. The White House for a while, I don't know if they're still doing it, they floated the idea that every graduate from US universities that are foreign born and, and majored in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics should get a green card to see if they would stay here, right? It, that, that's how intense the concern is about attracting talent, right? And so from, I guess, from the perspective of defense industries, the government, the brain drain is a good thing in the sense that it brings people that, 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 that perhaps can be used for industries and to keep the country ahead of other countries in, in, uh, in those technologies. Okay, um, here we go. What I wanted to do, a, a couple of things in my perspectives on brain drain is to think about the unit of analysis when we talk about brain drain, we talk about, we're thinking of Mexico, the US, nation states. And I think just by the, by the phrase brain drain, it seems like it's a negative effect, right? Drain is something that's running out, you know, brain is leaving, whatever. But I'm thinking if you change the unit of analysis from the nation state to perhaps the, a region, a region that connects two countries, Mexico, the United States, and then we look at what talent from Mexico does in that region on both sides of the border, that maybe the brain drain doesn't look like it's much of a drain if it's benefiting Mexican citizens who are in the US, right? So that's, this is a, a the cover of a book of a, a, a research colleague of mine, Ruben Hernandez Leon, who's at UCLA, and this book is actually his dissertation that he did uh, about 10 years ago and it's about migration between Monterrey and Houston. And originally he was gonna call this the Houston-Monterrey connection, but uh, the publisher said, no, no, Metropolitan Migrants, which sells more, right? And so this, is, this whole book talks about how Monterrey and Houston have become very interlinked in terms of businesses and labor migration, right? So, there is this region, this corridor, if you will, of the houston Monterrey connection, and I'll talk more about it in the next slide. But this is exactly what I'm saying, that when you were looking at the effects of brain drain, it may help to look at specific regions where the brain power is coming to, and for whom is it producing, for whom is it uh, producing benefits, right? So there are many occupations for which the border doesn't have any holding power that people can cross, a machinist can do work in Monterrey, can do work in Houston, because those are, in, in terms of industrial profiles, they tend to be similar. They both have large need for industrial workforces, right? And so uh, both business and labor have formed international strategies to work in this Houston-Monterrey corridor, and so it, it's becoming very attractive, and now we see business elites coming over because of fear and violence to San Antonio, or to the immediate border area, McAllen or the Woodlands, or even in Austin now we have the editor of two of the leading Mexican newspapers lives in Austin and commutes to Mexico City every week you know, and then comes back, all right? And so that's, so that's one of my, my questions is at what level of analysis should we analyze the effects of brain drain 
Okay, and here a little bit more on the uh, Houston Monterey connection. In the late 1980s and the 1990s, the industrial city metropolis of Monterey underwent restructuring, and it it cut back on large workforces and large factories into smaller and more what they is considered more effective and uh, productive uh, factory system, and that displays something like 40,000 um, workers skilled machinists and semi-skilled from the Monterey uh, labor force. Many of those, I don't have the number, and I'm using information from uh, 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 Ruben's book, and this, this, this should be, this is the wrong title here, and I, I apologize, but this should be Mexican immigrant workers in Houston industries. So this, are, this is the wrong title, and I apologize. So Mexican immigrant workers in Houston industries, and what we find is that in 1980, in the metal industries in the Houston metropolitan area, about 6% of the workforce was from Mexico. In 1990, that percent grew to about 17%, and by the year 2000, Mexican immigrant workers in Houston metal industries increased to about 23%. So this is some of the regional uh, movement of skilled and semi-skilled labor that I'm talking about was in this Houston-Monterey connection, right? I don't know how many of these are actually from Monterey, but I would assume that of the 40,000 that were displaced when Monterey underwent economic restructuring, a good number of them came to Houston and found work here in the 1990s. And we know that because Ruben interviewed many of them for his book, right? And you can look at other industries here where Mexican immigrant skilled precision cutters and other occupations have increased their presence in the, the, the Houston Monterey corridor there, et cetera, et cetera. So that this just leads to my point that, you know, it's not like the Mexican skilled labor just goes randomly throughout the country, except for, for some very few, we probably find more distribution of Mexican skill in universities as professors, let's say, than, than we do among machinists. But that there are there, in some cases, there are specific regions where Mexican skilled labor is very important on the U.S. side and supports Mexican communities, many of whom uh, send money back to Mexico. Uh, when I was here for 20 years at the University of Houston, I spent most of my time in the East End, the old Mexican-American neighborhoods of Segundo Barrio and Magnolia. And I spent a good part of my time in Galton, right? And now, because of family uh, affairs and matters, I've had to come into Houston from Austin and into North Houston by Tidwell, N North Airline, West Little York, and Air uh, Eldine Westfield. Many, m m maybe all of you have been there, or many, m only a few of you have been there, and this is an HEB that's right there. I'm amazed at what I see. That That's like the biggest Mexican neighborhood I've seen in Texas, bigger than in San Antonio, right? And it's probably one of the biggest in the whole Southwest. And I asked my colleagues here at the university, has anybody done a study what's going on in North Houston? And they said, no, well, the Houston Chronicle ran a story once. I mean, so what you'll find there is large populations of Mexican citizens, right, with U.S. born children, whatever, many of whom or not participating in the mainstream for whatever reasons, the language, right? But you will find a number of Mexican professionals from Mexico who've come into neighborhoods like this, not just this, right? And they, they're Mexican professionals, Mexican citizens, providing direct services, professional services, skilled services to Mexican citizens in Houston, right? So that brain drain doesn't seem too, too bad to me, right? Is that they're not just, they're helping co-patriots, right? So the people, we're, we're always gonna have, when you have two countries touching each other, you're always gonna have ethnic communities spill over. Uh, and and it, some of them are still in the ethnic uh, community level. They're not participating that much in mainstream, but they still need services, medical, professional, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so we have people from Mexico coming over to provide that for them, right? So I've, I've met, like, the Spanish language media in, in Houston heavily dependent on Latin America and Mexico. And their audience is mainly Latino or Mexican, right? There are Mexican immigration lawyers in Houston who are providing services to Mexican citizens who want to get a green card or, be, or, 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 or change their immigration status. There are Mexican medical doctors and nurses in Houston whose patients are mainly people from Mexico, right? Uh, dentists, I can, I can go on and on. Uh, I heard a story of a dentist who came from, who would come from Monterrey to the Galton area, set up weekend business in the, in the apartment complexes, have Mexicans come and he'd do it. Then on Sunday he'd pick up and go back to Monterrey, right? I'm not at all s saying that's good, that's illegal, <laughs> but I can see why, it, why they, it's functional, right? Uh, <laughs> is that like a <laughs> religious people? They're, they're religious uh, uh, pastors who've come over from Mexico and do services for for parishioners who've left Mexico, but they're still sending money back, et cetera, et cetera. And they they come here and they perform services, weddings, whatever. Actually, when I first saw this, was in the Galton area where I met a Salvadorian pastor who would come to golf then like two or three times a year to, to provide religious services to his villagers because half of his village had come over to, to Houston and the other half was still in El Salvador. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you look at specific regions, <laughs> brain drain, uh, the negative effects are not like Mexico has lost its professional people for the benefit of the U.S. It's, it can be more like Mexico is losing professional people to the Houston area. But when you know what? When they get to Houston, they're servicing Mexican citizens that are still not fully integrated into uh, U.S. society. <coughs> Let me switch the, the perspective here. My friend, colleague Jackie Hagan, co-author, just got a book out was co-authors called Skills of the Unskilled. And she's looking at people who are going back to Mexico. I, you probably all know by now that net migration between Mexico, from Mexico to the US is about zero. There are as many people coming as there are people going back. In fact, we think now there are many more going back than are coming here, right? And many are people who just decided it's time to go back and others are, they've been deported. Okay, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you're a Mexican, you are deportable, okay? Uh, and so she went with her team to uh, Guanajuato and interviewed people who've gone back to Mexico, either because they decided to go back or because they were deported. And she found that many are taking skills that they didn't have when they first came over, and they're taking skills back to, to, to Mexico. In fact, she reports in her study in Guanajuato uh, that t they interviewed like something like 200 people, return migrants. 31% of returning Mexican migrants to Guanajuato underwent mobility to a higher skill job than they had when they left Mexico, right? So deportations, well, that's not the way we want to send skill back to Mexico, but the point is that there is some apparently significant amount of of, of skill transfers back into Mexico. And so it's, we, no one has looked at this yet, right? Uh, one of the things that, that is, for me, amazing, I've had a couple of students go into El Salvador to do this research, is the number of call centers that are, that are emerging that are using English-speaking deportees. Uh, in 1996, Congress passed a new law to facilitate deportations. In 1995, the U.S. deported 50,000 people. Last fiscal year, or 2013 fiscal year, the United States deported something like 438,000 people. A big chunk of those are people who were brought here, migrants, when they were little children. And so their first language is English. And they're deported back to Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. And so, they may not be taking many skills, but they're taking English skills. And so there's a growing call center industry. That's what you call if you have a problem with your computer or something. And 
and th so they need English speakers, and so they're finding that deportees make great workforces, many of them. And I have a student who did a master's thesis, just finished it uh, this month, is finding that the deportees take back English skills. And there's a call center in Mexico City that uses a lot of de deportees as well, right? This is ironic, like we don't want to send skills to Mexico through deportees, right? We don't, but it's happening, and okay. And my last slide, because my time is, is out, is just wanted to show you one way that skill migrates, brain drain, at least the temporary brain drain, is through these specialty visas. We have a H-1B visa, and that's for skilled people, uh, physicians, computer programmers, uh, nurses, who can come for three years and then renew their visa for three more years, right? But during that time, many of those actually adjust the visa and get a green card. Right now, we're averaging about a, a million green cards a year, permanent residents who can stay here permanently. Half of those one million per year are visa adjustments from these and other visas, right? So the specialty visa, all I wanted to do was to show you where Mexico is in sending this skill labor to the U.S. The, the blue is Mexico, right, and then the red is Canada, and then China is the green. So Mexico is, in terms of sending <coughs> temporary skilled workers to the U.S., has been keeping uh, pretty much, pretty close to what China's doing. China's a huge country, right? But Canada is up there too, and then I don't know what happened in 2010, I haven't looked into this, but Canada now is really shut up. The big group there, and it's so big I couldn't put it in the graph, is India. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico is averaging about what, 20,000, or 15,000. India averages about 130,000 computer programmers. Okay, so that's a whole other game. Okay, so my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of uh, very provocative statements. Uh, uh, let's open it to a conversation, uh, and I myself will have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, right here, yes. behind you, and then next uh, I'll go back to you. Yeah. When, when it was compared, what kind of jobs people then they what kind of jobs they have in the United States and some have to go into lower status or remain the same. The point is that it didn't take into account the mastering of the language. Because if you have a high education in Mexico but you don't know or you don't speak fluent English, when you come to the United States, you have difficulties finding equal jobs. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually one of the arguments I was posing at the beginning that, you know, it's not really this free transfer of skills or this, you know, free flow of skill because there are documentation and language and other social capital and cultural capital uh, considerations that actually might become the main barrier to occupational uh, transfer. So you might as well be a doctor, an MD, but when you come here, you don't know, you don't speak English, and you you know didn't study in the American system, so you don't you don't have your MCATs, and you never took all those tests, and you don't have the credentials, so you might you might as well have no degree, and that's exactly the problem that you know you have a vast a vast number of these people who are not gaining occupationally to their skills are people who don't have language skills and people who don't have documentation. Because actually, there's a very large number of people who migrate to the US without documents, even when they have high school, college, and beyond degrees. You know, So it's not, undocumented migrants are not the peasants who are uneducated, it's everybody. So this is a very important thing to consider, especially in more recent years. I think one of the things that Mexico has to work on, on in that regard, if I may, is curricular uh, tuning and licensing agreements between the two countries. Yeah. That is not available, but I think it's a good um, uh, kind of public policy issue to take up in the future. Indeed. Correct? 
you, you're entirely right. And actually, one of the important things, and I mean, some of the, the example Nestor is giving, you know, this large number of skilled workers who are coming here on H visas, for instance, there's a whole other parallel flow with the TN visas, which are what they're called the NAFTA visas. The NAFTA visas, nobody used them ever because, uh, I don't know, the NAFTA started and nobody knew about them. And I think by 2004, it was like just a few hundred people who actually had them, and all of a sudden they exploded. So now you have several thousand, maybe 7,000 to 9,000 more currently. So they are almost paralleling this H-1V um, uh, you know, flow. And now, the TN visas have a, an interesting restriction that the H-1B visas don't have, that you have to commit to return to Mexico. So you, they are just like the H-1B, that you can have them for three years, renewable to another three years. But before you apply for it, you have to sign an affidavit where you commit to return to Mexico at the end of the duration of the visa. So it's a slightly different agreement, because Nestor was very rightly speaking about how many H-1B um, recipients actually eventually transition into green cards. The TN visa, uh, I actually haven't looked too deeply into it, but that will be interesting to see. You know, Are they going back to Mexico? Are they staying here? How is that working out for them? Because the, obviously, probably the largest recipient of TN visas has been Canada, but Mexico Mexico's right up there, too. So. Your question. My, my other point. Like, oh, go, I'll follow up and then I'll come back to you. My other point is that immigration is always a difficult thing. Immigrant has has cultural problems, family problems, and is not well accepted by the local society. And you can compare it to previous immigration waves from Ireland, from any other countries. I think the way to see if it's a race related attitude is to see, to compare, not in the same generation, but how their children are doing. Because usually the children are doing much better than the generation that had immigrated. So actually, I'm so glad you say this because you give me, you, you just resume a very important part of my argument, which is the, the, the fact that um, you have, in, so the main part of my argument is precisely this, other things being equal, there are still going to be inequalities. So you might have the same degree, you might have been born in the US, but you remember I still, you still saw some, of, some gaps in income, right? So what are those? Well, if you ask me, those are racial biases or uh, you know, my, you know, some kind of labor discrimination bias. Because by the way, you know, we are already accounting for the structure of the composition of the populations. So anything that might have to do with being more educated or being younger or being older or having more experience is it's already taken out. And this difference that I'm showing you is just the stuff that pertains to other things, you know, those unobservable things which might have to do with some of these biases. Um, some of the what you're saying might actually be visible in the comparison that I had with US born Mexicans versus um, foreign born Mexicans. If you saw, the gap was much bigger for for foreign born Mexicans. Now, there's going to be like a dual problem going on here between the foreign born and the US born because with the US born, you do have a great, great degree of disadvantage. You know, second and third generation Mexicans might not, you know, they might be attaining slightly better than their parents, but they're still not attaining at the level of, you know, the rest of the American population. Whereas with the Mexican, the foreign born Mexican, you have, you, you have the original flow of less educated rural workers or, or you know, low skilled urban workers but now, like Jesus is talking about, you have a very uh, a growing flow of skilled workers. So you, so even within the foreign born, now we're talking about this dual, um, I guess, more heterogeneous group, and we have to pay attention to that as well. So some of the Mexicans, foreign born Mexican, might actually be doing better than second or third generation Mexicans, but that's because they're coming from the elite background of Mexican education and you know all the people Jesus is talking about. And uh, so we should bear that in mind when we look at these figures as well. Great, here. Uh, well, uh, some of them covered, but if you look, there appears to be no bias at high school level. Mm -hmm. But there's a bias at the college level. One is, um, I hate to say this, but all Mexican universities aren't that great. So the fact that you have a degree from some school in Mexico does not mean that you're comparable to somebody with a U.S. degree. Well, if you go, if you went, if you went to UNAM or CIDE, I don't know. Those are very good schools. Um, but I, I would say that uh, you might be right in the, but. 
so we're using data, and this is actually a data limitation that anybody who studies immigration always has. The data, so this data is great, but it doesn't tell us very much about the background of the people. So some of these Mexi foreign born Mexicans that I have in that group could have studied in the US. Okay. Well, I think if we look at Una, we're talking about 250,000 students. Now, if you say Etam and Sida, I would agree with you, because but those are really very well selected people and they do very I know UNAM has been, has been breaking a lot of records in STEM, STEM and STEM and Polytechnic. On this. Let me intervene mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. It, there, there is a very important difference between college education in Mexico and in the United States. In Mexico are professional schools. Yes. In the United States are liberal arts college. In Mexico if you study let's say economics since the first day that you go to college, you start learning math, statistics, macro, yeah. you know, all the fields in economics. I worked in CIDA for more than 20 years. And my students, where did my students went? With no problem. Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, Berkeley, Chicago, right? So why? Because they have more courses in economics, in political science, or in biology than the entire college group of people in the United States. Here you take two years of your major, and sometimes you don't even know what is going to be your major in your third year, and they allow you to do that. You know, so in Mexico you don't have that. I study history in Mexico, and then my university try to certify me as a, as a history professor. And I said, yes, I can teach Mexican history. I, I, I work on that. And he said, how many courses did you take on, on, on history as a field? 42 courses. You know how the Americans are taking? Eight, 10. So why? Because the major is very small. It's just two years, if you are lucky. So this is one element. The second is, yes, you are right, the massive group of people like UNAM, it has a lot of problems. But there are fields that are very good. For instance, architecture, medicine, biology. Sure, you can jump just like this. Here. I mean, there's no problem. You have more problems if you are in, let's say, well, this is, this is a, a fantastic university, but, but a decent university like uh, SMU. You have more problems in SMU to jump to Harvard than a Mexican. From, uh, from, from, from a good school. From Ibero? Even from UNAM. I no. studied in Ibero. That no, was my university. I, I know, I knew a lot of people in the Ivy League who were from UNAM, and actually the UNAM has really good pro programs in STEM. Perhaps the most prominent political biology. scientist now, yeah. or is becoming one of the most politi prominent political scientists, is Guillermo Trejo, that works at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Guillermo Traco studied in UNAM yeah. and worked for f six years at CIDE. He wrote his dissertation at CIDE and then he went to, to Duke and then he's in, in uh, his life 45 years. I think it sort of points out that one thing is, is schooling and curriculum mm -hmm. and another thing is really um, native talent of the individual. And, and that can happen there, that can happen here, and that can happen anywhere. But if you look at the numbers, only 22% of professionals got Jobs. Yeah, but that, that, that has less to do with the professional degree them itself, and I think that's what I was saying just before, that if you, so you here, right, if you want to go get a job, you're an American, man or woman, if you want to go get a job, you go with your degree from Rice, and you tell people, I went to Rice, and I'm a political scientist, and, you know, people will like, oh, Rice, perfect, okay, and they know, right, but you might have, regardless of how, or the quality of the degree, the people who are employing you might have no idea what Tech de Monterrey is, or might have, I mean, Houston is a bad example because obviously you have so many Mexican people here, but you know, it's not just about your degree then, because then, okay, you have a degree from Tech de Monterrey or from CIDE, but wait, do you have, uh, are, you, are you a citizen? Well, not really. Uh, well, so what kind of visa would you have to, so m many jobs won't sponsor you. Many jobs just won't sponsor you for a visa. I ju they just won't, no matter how great you are. Some jobs would. Actually, the academic environment is actually pretty good at that. But other jobs are not very good at that, especially, you know, um, 
very specialized things like let's say um, business or in, you know some so even some engineering jobs. Pick up a question jobs. over here and then go back to the middle. Yeah. I just have two comments and then I have a question. Specifically related to Gabriela. The first is about green card. Uh, green card uh, technically you cannot get a green card stapled to your degree even if you're in a STEM field. I have a PhD from the University of Michigan. I'm Indian citizen. Uh, and I, my, what I was told was seven years away. I mean, I took a recommendation from Hillary Clinton uh, under a very special category, extraordinary ability to, to get it. Uh, so it's not instantaneous. Uh, second, labor market, even though I have a PhD and my expertise in computational math, um, is totally racist. I mean, I mean, social networks absolutely matter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Given my background, um, they wouldn't hire me you know, the top banks, but they hired a white bachelor's degree mm -hmm. Uh, to do that job. Yeah. And what I did is after that, I started a hedge fund. And as soon as I did that, I had my own business. You had whites lining up my door for jobs mm -hmm. and offering me hundreds of millions of dollars, like how can you invest our money? Um, so that what, that's what made me realize is the real power is not in <clears throat> taking a job. The real power is in creating jobs. Or real power is in business creation. Um, so if you have the money, and you have the money once you have a business, is that's when you can really influence things. So uh, I think, um, Nestor, you had that picture of that Mexican establishment. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, Gabriela, you did some work with the whole wages and mm -hmm. big people are born and stuff. Have you guys examined the influence of creating businesses, an influence mm -hmm. of a really owning capital? Because when you own capital, <coughs> then you can do whatever the hell you want to do with it. Yeah, I, I haven't ex examined that. By, by the way, the, the thing about the green card and and STEM, it was a proposal that the White House put in their website for a while that they wanted to air out. I think they dropped it or something, but it was just an I idea of the Obama administration to make it easy for STEM graduates from other countries to get green cards. But it has. you're right, it hasn't gone anywhere. I haven't looked at, at visas for people who bring certain capital. There are visas for that. Uh, it, I don't know the specific amount e of money. E-visas, and you have to have at least half a million dollars. Have a million and create 10 jobs or something like that for, for three years or something like that. Right. Yeah. Like, it's like half a million dollars or 50 jobs. Is yeah. when Mexicans come or immigrants come, doesn't matter where you are, if you right. come and you actually own a business or start a business. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm talking about, is then you can create jobs for whatever, whoever you want. Sure. Then you can really influence your environment. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, have you guys, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, the differences you talked about, 25, Actually, very uh, small. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm talking about really big, like, you know, 100 mm -hmm. oh, yeah. plus jobs. Or and I'm actually really glad you mentioned that, because in this particular case, we are only including people who earn money for from from someone else uh, we've we've taken out because these will be tremendously biased if you take the people who are self-employed mm -hmm. so there's a good chunk of people who actually like you're saying they they have their own business they make their own money and so they, they, they I guess the disparity we want to estimate here has to do with will someone pay you as much as they will pay the person next to you uh, and in reality if you're making your own money because you're a business owner you you know it's your thing there might be some bias associated with who would be willing to make business with you but I don't think those are so great. Uh, but yeah, I um, the data is not great, but it's something that should be looked into. I did not look into it because it's a, it would bias the results on the other areas. Um, but I mean, speaking of uh, just the Mexican, you know, the 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 number of uh, business visas I have the, from Mexico has just grown ridiculously in the last several years. It's, in fact, I had a yeah. student uh, who used to work at the Juarez uh, consulate, American consulate, and. Uh, I asked her to do a survey for me, and uh, uh, we realized that the legal migration from Mexico to the United States, a lot of it family reunification, but at that point, that's about five years ago, it was 250,000 legal uh, uh, Mexican migrants to the United States, and that began to approach the number of undocumented. And so today, when you talk about net zero, it's not really net zero, it's net zero illegal. But the well, legal uh, migration is, uh, has continued apace. Uh, it's no longer, Juarez is no longer the point of entry because they don't require people to go to that consulate. Before it used to be the bottleneck and everybody had to go, fly into Juarez and go to that consulate. Today you can go to different consulates. But the number of Mexicans that are still 
annually migrating is enormous and many of them are beginning to move away from that rural poor mm -hmm. population into middle class upper class educated there's a whole new wave of mexican migration that is exactly what i think needs to be looked at today let me pick up a couple of questions here in the middle yes and then i'll, I'll make my way all the way there yeah did i hear you correctly to say the average number of years of education is 7.2 i did is not give that figure Jesus did. Is school not compulsory? In it is, but it's not completed. Actually, uh, uh, right now, I think it's closer to nine mm -hmm. uh, by the, in, the, in the recent census. Mm -hmm. so, Mexican, uh, so Mexican education is compulsory up to, uh, it used to be compulsory up to middle school, like ninth grade, but more in the past few years, maybe three years ago, they make it compulsory all the way to high school. But the, degrees, the rates of completion are still very low. Yeah, and it's great variation even into Central America. Yeah. If there's even a school near the village, or that's well, a very big problem. Yeah, yeah, or is a teacher in some places the teachers get their jobs because their father or mother had the jobs. They inherit the job, so it's it's not you know it, there are many great schools I know in Mexico or Central America, but there are many places that it's it's just. But in Mexico, what also happens is that you have you might have a middle school in your town, but you might not have a high school. Right. So, so if you want to go to high school, you would have to move somewhere else, and most people don't have that resource. In fact, coverage drops. Hmm? Tuition for college? It depends. Uh, so there's the public schools. Uh, they do have a tuition, but sometimes it's nominal, like you know, just a symbolic thing, like an UNAM or. Uh, but some state universities are more expensive than others. Some uh, there's a lot of private schools, so there's a, there's a great variation yeah. in that too. I have a question here and then back here. Did you have a question? Yeah, I think well, uh, what you presented the, uh, the the bias as towards uh, Latins that have been what were born over here in the U.S. is impressive because usually we were thinking that uh, once. There are locals that get diluted. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, again, I guess biases are a human nature. We have them in Mexico. There's every, everywhere is biases because as humans, we have that. No? Mm -hmm. But do you think that policies like the US has implemented, like affirmative action, really help to solve, uh, to, solve or to address those biases? And if so, well, don't they affect the basis of the U.S., which is uh, arguably meritocracy <coughs> and competition and the best person for the best role? I think the first thing to know is that there, there is really not meritocracy. I mean, there's a lot of experiments that you know psychologists and economists have done, like to see who would get a job. I don't know if you've heard about. They, they're, they're always in the media because they're like really uh, glitzy. Like they they send CVs with like Hispanic sounding names and African American sounding na names, and they see who gets the most calls. And you know, there's and this is actually how we know that there might there might still be some bias that you know the people who have seemingly, I guess, white sounding names tend to get more callbacks even with the same CVs or the, the same resume. Um, and so my concern here is that I feel like I'm not entirely sure that we really know where that bias is coming from other than these highly unobservable and highly um, untangible thing that we call racism. <laughs> so it's so so I do think that you know policies like affirmative actions have been have been helpful in, in creating in creating inclusion, but I don't think it's the only way to go. And I wish I, I, I even I myself I I'm, I think about you know what else could we do and um, I I you know sometimes it has to do in my opinion sometimes it just has to do with um, access to the opportunity, right? So Affirmative action happens once you are actually there and you have applied. But what if you didn't even get it? You didn't even get to the door, right? Some of the problems have to do with that. I mean, some of the some are minority. Some minority children don't even get to the door, right? So how do you get them to the door? Um, and that's something. I mean, speaking of the U.S. born, I mean, we see bigger and bigger and bigger educational gaps for minority children. You know, we see that uh, even if they get a high school degree, the quality of the education is relative, is very low because they tend to go to bad schools compared to the schools other people go to. There's the segregation and many other issues have had to do with the diminishment in the quality of education that. Um, that Hispanic and black kids get. And, and I haven't even brought up the issue of African Americans, because actually this, the type of study that I'm showing you has been actually widely done for African Americans as well. I have a question here. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much for this panel. Just 
incredible content. Really appreciate the perspectives. I've got two very quick questions. One for you, Gabriella. Relative to your findings, did you differentiate between those that were illegal and legal? And because I didn't, that wasn't necessarily reflected, I think, in your content. And I would wonder if that would skew your results one way or the other. Yeah. So with the first half of the study, the Mexican Migration Project, we did account for that. So documentation was definitely a, a, a determinant of lower status. Um, basically, if you don't have a document, or rather on documentation, <laughs> if you don't have documents, you were more likely to end up in a job that's less off less than the one you had before. And you were more likely to not get better. Um, for, interestingly enough, because a, a lot of the migrants who the, in, in this sample eventually became uh, green card holders, many of them through family reunification policies, many of them through you know IRCA and many other policies. So at the end, me, much fewer than when they were, were undocumented than at the very beginning of their migration career. Now, for. For the second part of, of the study, the American Community Survey, actually the U.S. Census and no national data actually collects this information. So we are completely unable to tell. Well, yeah. Just, to, just as a follow-up, mm -hmm. I can, and I would like to get to uh, you, Jesus, mm -hmm. is um, that might be very beneficial for the audience when you're presenting that information oh, sure. to differentiate, and especially it identifies, I would think, based on what you just said, the mobility mm -hmm. of those from low wage to higher wage based upon their status yeah. and the value associated with the status that would propel them to higher wages. Just a, just a thought. Oh, and by the way, I have to say that uh, it was, it, even though it was influential, it was not even as influential. I think other things like credentialing and language had more to do with it, unfortunately, yeah. You said something very interesting at the outset that I found um, somewhat disturbing and, and insightful at the same time. And one of the conditions in Mexico are um, the structural conditions are not going to change. And I think you made a comment that they're actually going to worsen. So the conditions there drive migration to the United States because of that. At which point? Do you see Mexico, and this is coming from an uneducated or not less than knowledgeable perspective, and I'll grant that right out of the gate. At which point does Mexico implode and create an even worse situation, not only just for the population leaving the United States, but basically fleeing to any place that's safe? That's a complicated one. <laughs> Part of this you know, uh, uh, Yogi Berra said once that you never make predictions, especially when you talk about the future. Uh, so that's a complicated one. But the thing is that in many ways, Mexico and the United States have a silent integration at the level of high skill workers. Step by step, I'm not saying that is is done. Why? Because um, there are a bunch of programs there is a new, I'm talking about the elites. They are talking about different kind of people. Uh, there is a new generation of people that are fully bilingual. I was talking with, with my friends here and you know, the generation of my son, my son doesn't have an accent. And I know like 50 kind of friends or colleagues that their sons doesn't have an accent. Why they, they were here? So that's one element. The second element is that the market is here. In Mexico, you get more rewards if you publish in the United States than if you publish in Mexico. You know, CIDE pay you more because they, it's like pay-per-view in CIDE. So if you publish, they pay you. If you publish in a top journal in the United States, you can get $2,000 just for doing your job. Conacids give you money, but that's not enough for Mexicans. Then that's that's you know I can go on and on and on and on at the at the level then of of education. Then the conditions of Mexico. I mean, I was just in Mexico two weeks ago, and when you see corruption in the country, it's unbelievable. I mean, we said that the pre was corrupted. Yes, for many years. Then you go to the pan and, and, and it's the same. And then you hope that the PRE, you know, it's the same. So it's like, who is worst? 
So that's that's a very central problem. And there's there is a new study that was just published yesterday about the correlation of democracy and corruption, right? And and, and the correlation is very bad for Mexico. Second, there are, there are a lot of violence that is out of control by the government. I mean, out of control. How do, there are many people said that there is a bunch of drugs in in Mexico City, but all the drug cartels are in Mexico City, so they don't fight each other, right? They have their own terrains. But when you move to different parts of the country, you, you don't want to go to Tamaulipas. I mean, you don't want to go. However. This is also a myth in, in, in Mexico because there are parts of Mexico that are very safe. If you go to the Yucatan Peninsula, it's safer than Canada, according to some studies. And Canada is pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, it's not the entire country. It's highly concentrated in Mexico City. This is, comes from the colonial period. I mean, the United States, one of the problems that we were just mentioning in our conversation before this, in the United States, there were 13 colonies that were autonomous, almost. You know, one of the problems was to integrate those colonies. In Mexico, it was highly centralized since the beginning of the colonial period in what is Mexico. So to, to have a relationship in the United States, you have to go to the states. And the states are, you know, most of my time in the United States, I have spent it in Texas, in Austin, and right now in the metroplex of Dallas Fort Worth. Jesus Christ, this, this is absolutely different. Austin is not Texas, it's Austin. <laughs> and, and Fort Worth and that area is the Bible Belt. So you have more churches than McDonald's, Taco Bell, Wendy's combined. So it, it, this is a very different situation. Of course, the politicians are very conservative. The society is extremely conservative. I know that there are centers like, like here or Dallas or the main cities, which are not the same case. But just go to West Texas. Let me pick up uh, one last. If you bear with me a minute, I'll pick up uh, two questions at once, and we'll close. So your question, and then your question, and then last comment. Well, thank you very much to this panel once again, like he was mentioning. And thank you for some of the jokes that were mentioned in there. So <laughs> keeping, the, keeping it light, even though it's a serious subject. Um, I wanted to maybe change a little of the conversation based on the book that Nestor Rodriguez and mm -hmm. putting on Guatemala U.S. migration by focusing a little more on the Central American part. My own interest is mainly because I am myself Central American and also studied here at Rice. So. Um, I wanted to ask about specifically on the, the point of Central American, uh, how we might how one might end up being able to get a basic outline of what Jesus described for Mexico and the brain circulation and the situation with the universities in Mexico and how similar or not similar it could be described for the cities of the Northern Triangle, or the countries of the Northern Triangle. Yeah. Hold your Are answer. There any similarities or anything that you could uh, note? Hold your answer, Nestor, for a second. I'll pick up this question, and we'll close with the answers. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, one of the slides said that the remittances, uh, remittances, remittances. That, that go from the United States to Mexico are not that significant. Is there a reason? How does it compare with other countries? Well, okay, Nestor. Well, Nestor. Nestor. Uh, okay. <coughs> okay, quickly here, a comparison between what Jesus describes in Mexico and then Central America. All the indications that I see are that the situation is much worse in Central America. Uh, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala. We, we, I've been busy with students doing a new study on return migration, going back to Mexico, and but also to Central America, and we find that there's there's a, a very distinguished return migration pattern into into Mexico, not just because of deportation, but because peop many people are going back. Some because they always came w and went back, and some because they're going back for different reasons. Right? But it's, we don't find like a strong return migration to Central America. In fact, we find the opposite: more people fleeing. In fiscal year two, 2013, for the first time ever, 
The Border Patrol arrested more undocumented Central Americans than undocumented Mexicans for the first time ever in the history of the Border Patrol. So what, what that's telling me, even in spite of what Mexico is doing to stop the, the Central American migration, mm -hmm. and that's a whole other issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mexico is working very hard. I assume uh, as, uh, that it's a response to Washington to turn back the Central Americans, right? I kind of think, well, that just gives the Mexicans a, a head start in the U.S. from the undocumented mark. But that's another question and another another panel. Another panel. Uh, uh, Jesus. Well, two, two little things. Just one mention. There is also an important uh, 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 movement of high skilled workers in within Latin America. Mm -hmm. For instance, right now the Venezuelans are going a lot because they don't the ones that don't speak English to Panama. They are finding a lot of jobs in Panama. But just just one right. thing. And even Mexico what I was, is full of even in Mexico right? of course. Yeah. But you know I just want to give one example. Uh, I was talking about high skilled workers that send money to Mexico. Most of them do not send money. Why? Because they are middle class or, or upper middle class Mexican people. The parents do not need that money. But second, even if they send, which we do not know, it's very difficult to trace because they send wires. So I can give you my own example. My son decided after study high school here that he wants to study in Mexico. I will almost kill him. <laughs> Right, I sent a lot of money to pay his school and his maintenance in Mexico, all his personal expenses. I have never sent in the regular, always sent wires. And I, I have done this for three years, and just wires. So it's very difficult to find that, that information. I, I don't know if these guys uh, know how to trace that, but up to my knowledge, there is no way. You could, but you wouldn't know what it is from. Like, you know, it could just be that you're paying something. So, you know, the bank wires, they just end up clustering all the bank exactly. wires. Exactly. So you can tell that they're for family remittances. Yeah. yeah. Let me try, uh, try to bring these uh, uh, um, threads together. So what's on the table? Who are these migrants? What's their skill? What's their education? Mm -hmm. How do they combine with the native prejudices already found in the United States, who are th returning, how do they circulate their skills, uh, how do they use the skills when they go back to Mexico or Central America, what are the reasons, what are the reasons they're getting out, what is the potential uh, um, push factor uh, increase in Mexico itself in the future, what is the labor integration in North America? Because I have a sense that there is a labor integration going on that the immigration system has not acknowledged and provided for. There's a lot of native talent. There are the skills of the unskilled, the people that are undesirable, that we don't necessarily want, but actually are roofers and sheetrock placers and sweepers and, and machinists and burger uh, people make our burgers. Those are skills. And we don't value them as much. So there's a number of very important topics that were brought to the table together. And I think we have a lot more questions than we have answers. But it's been a wonderful discussion. So help me thank our panel for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.